So, where do we start after Bruce? <laughs> and then you, you gave it all, Bruce. You're great. <laughs> and it's always interesting because we always get different views from everybody. If we went around the room and everybody had a chance to say what they get out of this section, it, it would be different with every single one. And I love that because that's the way God deals with each one of us individually. But I knew tonight we were talking about the trees, Tuf of Shabbat, which it simply means the 15th of Shabbat, uh, Shabbat being the name of the month. Uh, and it already has been said to you that's a new year for the trees. It was actually when they would bring the tithes in from the fruit trees to the priests, as long as the tree was four years of age mm -hmm. and above. Mm -hmm. The first three years, they did nothing with the tree. The fourth year, the fruit only went to the Lord. The people that eat from the tree till the fifth year. So you've got a long ways to go if you're just planting. <laughs> but by God's grace, five years, five is grace, <laughs> you'll get to that point. And technically, I think Bruce said it, but just to refresh our minds, it is considered early spring, but it is considered springtime in Israel because the almond trees are starting to bud. And the almond trees are one of the first. There's a few others that bloom this early. And, of course, they're hoping to get the early rains and the latter rains. So it is uh, time. Um, some believe that the origination of it came from a folk festival to re-emerge and welcome spring. I don't know. I don't know. I'll take it from the first fruits coming in to the Lord to, to, uh, to be given to the priest first, and of course that means to the Lord. But it definitely does mark our growing season. And uh, growing is what we all need to do. By the second temple destruction, the, the sages, the, the revered rabbis that were leading our people in the diaspora, being dispersed you know, out of Israel, out of uh, Jerusalem where they have the temple so they can't bring their ties, they can't bring their fruit in. What are they going to do? How are they going to recognize it? Well, they would choose to have a Seder, which means order. We have Passover Seder, but they would have an order where they would eat the seven fruits that are mentioned, or fruits and grains that are mentioned in the Torah. Wheat, barley, grapes, figs, pomegranates, olives, and dates. So they would say blessings and eat, say blessings and eat, and they'd say the special Shafi'i blessings, which are, again, just honoring our Lord, blessing what our Lord has done. And uh, they would try to get all these fruits. If they could get anything from Israel, that was a bonus. Sometimes we see that. Sometimes we have products. Um, I live in San Bernardino. It's off the map. <laughs> My dad would uh, meet with a group of men at a local restaurant every week. He um, was so friendly with the waitresses that when they had a big group and were overrun, he'd go into the kitchen, get the coffee pot, and help serve. So he goes in one time to get the coffee pot to help serve, and he comes back out to the, the men that were meeting, and he says, gentlemen, I want you to know, your orange juice this morning, fresh squeezed Jaffa oranges. He had seen the crate in the kitchen that they had been brought in from Jaffa, Jaffa, Israel. And so they actually had fresh squeezed orange juice from Israel. That would have been perfect for this time to remember. So Israel fills the face of the earth with her fruit. That's prophesied and she'll do it even greater. But yes. she's already got a start. <laughs> Let me take you to 16th century and take you to a little community in Safat. And if you've been to Israel or heard... Safat? Yes, Safat. Am I saying it wrong? Safat. Okay, okay. We just got pecan pecan here, that's all. <laughs> they are, are very mystical, and being very mystical, they looked at it that we need to repair. You see, we ate from the tree for our original sin. So we've got to repair that sin of eating from that tree of knowledge of good and evil in the Garden of Eden, and we need to bring to life the tree of life. Because remember, they had the tree of life that they could eat from also, but we don't know where the tree of life is now, they say. And so they'll eat these foods, and especially um, foods like the pomegranate that's full of seeds, they say there's a divine spark in each seed. And so as they eat, the spark will enlighten in them, and they'll be like the tree of life, and they'll help heal the hurt. 
boy. <laughs> Good try. But let me tell you, nowhere in scripture do I see that we can redeem ourselves from our original sin, especially by eating seeds. Amen. That just doesn't quite grow in my vocabulary. <laughs> Didn't take root. Didn't take root. There you go. 1948, we've got Israel, the, the miracle of the statehood of Israel, and one of the very first things our settlers did, and actually they did pre-1948 also, but yeah. legally, however I should say that, the right to it, the land being their own, is they planted trees. They planted trees and they started what's called the Moshav. The Moshav is a collective farm and they were uh, doing much to bring the land back to life. We know that they, they uh, dried up the swamps and there was so much they did, but planting trees has stuck with our people all the way down to today. So even those of us who are in the diaspora often at this time, we'll donate money to the Jewish National Fund is one of the larger, but there's a number of organizations to plant trees. When you're in Israel, sometimes on your tour group, they'll even set up, we did it because we wanted people to know they can have their roots in Israel. So we <laughs> let people plant trees on our groups and, and yet uh, it continues, like I say, whether they're in the land or not, but the children in the land especially on a school day, they will have, it's like an Arbor Day, and they'll recognize and they'll have the children plant trees. It's very, very important to them. And again, to them, it's the healing of the land, and that's what they want to take place. So these who, who are a little more, as I said, mystical, they'll say, well, we need to think about the healing of the land. We need to think about alleviating the suffering of the living creatures we need to express our love to Israel. All of this is good. It's just not that God has commanded it. But then they do get to scripture and they say, also, we need to recognize that we are not to destroy. And in particular, they're not to destroy the trees. And the way they draw that is from Dabarim, Deuteronomy chapter 20 and verse 19. When you besiege a city for a long time to make war against it in order to capture it, you shall not destroy its trees by swinging an axe against them, for you may eat from them, so you shall not cut them down. For is the tree of the field a human that it should be besieged by you? That's the question that's asked. Now, some of our interpretations change that a little, and by the time you get to some, it says in that last phrase, and after all, are the trees in the field human beings so that you have to besiege them too? And they take it that the trees are really living and they're like a human life and you're not to destroy life. So whichever way, whether you separate it or not, you can see that the idea given from scripture was to not destroy the trees. You're allowed to eat from them. I see God making this separate because there are times when he told them to go out and clear everything. And that's why to let them know they did not need to come against the trees. They could use them for fruit and they could eat from them. Uh, but as I said, Tukumshat is not mentioned in scripture, uh, in our Torah. But our Torah does tell us that God's the creator of all life. He created the vegetation, the vegetable life. We read that right back in the very beginning in Bereshit chapter 1. Verses 11 to 13, he brought forth the seed-bearing plants, the fruit trees, and every kind. And what did he have to say about it? Good. God said it was good. And then he commanded it to be food. That's what they were to eat. That's chapter 1 still, verse 29. Now, our midrash, our commentaries, our, our rabbis stalking back and forth and, you know, trying to get what they can out of it, they add on to it a warning. And that warning is to recognize it as God's creation, and they drew it from Viacra, Leviticus. Leviticus 19, 23 to 25, and chapter 26, verses 3 and 4. Again, when they enter the land and plant any tree for food, they're to consider that tree, and as the scripture put it, uncircumcised for the first three years. Then the fourth year, they bring that fruit in, make a holy offering, give praise to the Lord, and in the fifth year, you may eat it. And as we read also in Dabarim, they'll bring out again, and we're not to destroy. So we, we 
respect and we see it as a, a baby, a little sapling and getting its start and we have it along its way and giving it circumcised. <laughs> and then it's time to eat. So let me ask you a question then. Does God care about the trees? Yes. 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 I had a feeling you did that. <laughs> Interesting for David. <laughs> Would you like to tell me what I just heard you say? I said he cares about us. He cares about we us. Bear fruit. Yeah. Well, you want to come up here and finish this for a minute? Just jump to the end. <laughs> Let me take you back a little bit and say, Would you believe it? Oh, would? <laughs> would? Oh, 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 <laughs> I knew I'd have a tough time tonight. I knew the rich didn't be sharp with this out there. Let me tell you. Let me take you back to the beginning. Let me take you to the Garden of Eden. Well, I have to take you right outside the Garden of Eden because Adam and, uh, okay, Abel, of all. Adam and of all were talking. And they came near the Garden of Eden. They could see it. And of all especially, I was looking and I said, wow, Dad, that must have really been something to live in the Garden of Eden, to be able to eat from all of the trees. Wow, what was that like? And, and Adam looked at his son and he said, son, it was. It was the most wonderful experience until your mother ate us out of house and home. <laughs> oh, 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 oh. Thomas is not sure he likes that one. <laughs> but in the garden was the tree of life. Es ha chayim, the tree of life. And that was there in the beginning. We read of it in chapter 2 and verse 9 of Bereshit. In the end of all our scripture that's given us by God, we read about the tree of life again. And this time the tree of life is not in the Garden of Eden on earth, but it's in the midst of paradise. It's in the midst of heaven. We read it in the book called Revelation of Yeshua HaMashiach, Revelation of Jesus Christ. Chapter 22, very last chapter, first verses, one and two. And he showed me a river of water, of life, clear as crystal, coming from the throne of God and a lamb in the middle of the street. Um, I'm sorry, and in the middle of the street on either side of the river was the tree of life bearing 12 kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit every month. And the leaves of the trees were for the healing of the nations. Delicious, exactly. I can hardly wait. I can hardly wait. I'm a fruit lover. And I thought I'd had good fruit here, and I love my homeland. Sorry, I do. Don't take me wrong. But when I was in Israel and had vine ripe buns, Fruits. Oh, I, you, you've not tasted yeah. fruit. So right. I didn't grow up on a farm. Maybe if you grew up on a farm, you've had that, you know, where, where you have that. But I would eat that and I would think, this tastes so good. So when I eat from that tree of life, I bet I'm going to chuckle and say, and I thought that was good. <laughs> but it's very interesting that we have two ends of the history of man. And when we see them, we see that tree of life each time. Now, granted, it's separated by millennium. We don't know how long. Millenniums, I guess. How do I say that plural? Because it's already over a thousand years. It's already over two thousand. Millennium. Millennia. You're so right. Thank you. Thank you. I'm glad I've got people here to educate me. <laughs> but we don't know how many. We see the end of innocent man when he was in his innocence broke God's law, ate from that tree, and brought the consequences of sin on us to this day. Before he ate from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, he was told he had all rights to the tree of life. He was to eat from it. That was to keep him living. He wasn't going to age. When you age and you have those aches and pains, you can say, thank you very much, Adam. <laughs> but the very sad ending we know is they were cast out of the Garden of Eden and lost the right to the tree of life. We find the tree where the new man's end is, only it's the end of the beginning, because it's not really an end. It is an end to the life as we know it in this earth as we know it. But again, I'm referring to that tree of life that's now found in heaven that's waiting for us, that we will eat from in time. 
So it's very interesting. But uh, let me make clear, because Dave's already done it for us, God does not put us on the same level as the trees. Okay? He does care about the trees. He created them. He created them for our enjoyment. Have you ever seen a child climbing a tree? They're having a blast. I had a little tomboy niece who probably climbed trees till she was 12 or 13. Skin plenty of needs <laughs> climbing trees. We see trees as sustenance. We see trees as protection. We see all kinds of ways that we can look at the trees. And as we look at the symbolic language of the tree, we can see a lot from that also. Why do we view our heritage like a tree? Has anyone done their family tree? Oh. <laughs> what am I talking about? Are you looking for, oh, my great, great, great was an oak? <laughs> and, and, and my auntie was a palm? <laughs> Most of them were nuts. <laughs> <laughs> I can see too much. I can see too much. <laughs> but it is interesting that we ask about the family tree. We draw the family tree, and we draw it like a tree with branches and, you know, and so forth. And I think, okay, where did that come from? Do we see the roots in Scripture? Well, let me ask you this. I'm going to take you to the end again. I'm going to take you to Revelation 22 again. I'm going to take you to chapter 6, I'm sorry, verse 16, and the second part of it where Yeshua is speaking in a his revelation, who he is, everything being tied up that's been opened up in the Abera sheet. We're finding the whole complete at, at here in the end. And he uses a very interesting phrase for himself. He says, I am the root and the offspring or the descendant of David. Is that where the idea of the family tree came from? Where's our roots? Where did we come from? I don't know. I don't know. But it does tie in. It ties in very clearly with our prophet Yeshua, Isaiah, chapter 11 and verse 1, where we read, Then a shoot will spring from the stem of Yasha, or Jesse, and a branch from his roots will bear fruit. Or, as our complete Jewish Bible says it, that a branch will emerge from the trunk of Yeshua, a shoot will grow from his roots. So we see this one who said, I'm the root and the offspring of David, being referred to thousands of years earlier, 700 B.C. to, okay, so uh, less than 2,000, but still a long time apart. We see, again, that same analogy. We're talking about root, we're, or roots, we're talking about a branch, a shoot, something springing forth. And lest you say, well, wait a minute, how do you know Yeshua is talking about Messiah, who is the one speaking in Revelation? Well, let me just read you the next verses. I read you, I quoted to you uh, chapter 11 and verse 1. Verse 2 says, the spirit of the Lord will rest on him. The spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and strength, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. He will delight in the fear of the Lord. He will not judge by what he, his eyes see, nor make decisions by what his ears hear, but with righteousness he will judge the poor and decide with fairness for the humble of the earth, and he will strike the earth with the rod of his mouth. With his breath of his lips he will slay the wicked, and righteousness will be the belt around his hips, and faithfulness the belt around his waist. Now, can anybody say that's anyone other than Messiah? We know, we know. I could take these phrases, I could go all over Scripture, and it's always and only Messiah, Mashiach. So he is the root. He is the offspring. David, David comes from Jesse, from Yeshai. He Jesse was his dad. So we've got it right here. We see it. We see that connection. And when it gets especially to the phrase that, that the rod from his mouth, we know that's telling that song, that's uh, so many other places also. So I think we're okay using that analogy. If the Lord used it for himself as a tree, 
I think we can look at that and see what else he's saying for a man that he loves more than the trees in scripture too. And some of these scriptures are very familiar to you, but let's put our whole picture together. Okay, we've got to We've got to let our tree blossom. We've got to let the leaves come out and not drop off. <laughs> because telling Psalm 1 3 says, He will be like a tree planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in a season, and its leaf does not wither, and whatever he does prospers. That's for the righteous man, the man who is walking in righteousness. And compare that to the man who trusts in the Lord. This is our prophet Jeremiah, uh, Jeremiah chapter 17, verses 7 and 8. Blessed is the man who trusts in Adonai, whose trust is Adonai. Or another way to phrase that is Adonai is his security. And I don't know anybody, even you men, who don't at times know you need to feel secure in someone above yourself. This one who's trusting in the Lord, who's the Lord is his security, says, for he will be like a tree planted by the water that extends its roots by a stream. Sounds very much like the psalmist and Yermia are on the same page. And he does not fear when the heat comes, that its leaves will be free. And he will not be anxious in a year of drought, nor cease to yield fruit. I don't know about you, but I want to be like that tree. I don't want to wither. I don't want to have my leaves turn brown and be, be shriveling up. And I don't want to fear when the heat comes. I want to be the green leaf in drought time. So I'm going to follow this analogy. I'm going to get into this. I'm going to see what else we can learn. But let me take you also to an old Jewish custom. I don't know if Janet's familiar with it or not. She can let us know. That the old Jewish custom was when a baby boy was born, a cedar tree would be planted. Are you familiar? Okay, I was not either. When a girl would be born, a pine tree would be planted. And they called those trees the marriage trees. And when those children grew up, when they went to make the canopy, the hupa for them to be married under, they would use branches from the tree that was planted, rooted when they were born. Interesting. Interesting. I don't know where. I don't know if that was in Israel. I don't know where. I, I was not able to find that, but I liked that thought, and I could see that. And I see a lot from it because the children are growing like the trees grow. Yeah, so, And you can learn a lot from the cedar, from the pine. You know, there's a lot there. Well, following the illusion of Scripture, we know that God created this world to be inhabited. He did not create it chaotic. It became without form and void. I'm not here to talk about all that now, but trust me, that's the way the Hebrew says it. It became that way. He, God created it for habitation. Yeshua Isaiah 45 and verse 18. For thus is Adonai who created the heavens, God who shaped and made the earth, who established it and created it not to be in chaos, but formed it to be lived in, to be inhabited. I am Adonai, there is no other. So one could even say that the whole earth was supposed to be like a tree, and we humans are like the fruit of the tree. Okay? We can we can see that from scripture. And that is an interesting thought when I hear Yeshua say, by their fruit, you will know them. And he talks about how a good tree produces good fruit. A bad tree will only produce bad fruit, and the bad tree is to be cut down, but the good tree is not. And I remember thinking when I was young and little and hearing about the crab apple tree. Somehow in my mind that was always the bad tree. <laughs> I guess because I was crabby. <laughs> but by the way, the analogy of the good fruit from the good trees comes from the book of Matthew, Matthew chapter 7. And we see many times in Yeshua's time here on this earth in the human flesh that he took on for us because he came into the human race to redeem us, that he used the analogies like this, agricultural analogies. So he talked about sowing and reaping, and he likened people to the soil. 
there's four kinds of soil. There was the hard half, the hard soil, nothing penetrated it. There was the rocky, where it would go down but not deep, and it could be easily uprooted, and that was like the thorny that could be choked out, and thorns can choke anything out. And then there was the good soil, and of course the good soil is where we want to be. Uh, the seed that was sown among the others would be unprofitable, but the seed that was sown in the good soil, that's what would be able to be reaped later. And he talked about them being a harvest of souls. Harvest. We're seeing, he follows this analogy over, uh, continually. The harvest is plentiful. The laborers are few. Pray for the laborers of the harvest to gather in that harvest. And I'll take you back again a little further to Melech Shlomo, King Solomon, in Proverbs. Proverbs chapter 11 and 30 said, The fruit of the righteous is a tree of life, and one who is wise gains souls. So he saw the analogy of the tree. He saw this as living, and the idea is we should be working to harvest to gain these souls. Proverbs 3, verses 13 to 18 talk about to, to get wisdom, to get understanding. And when you do it, it is a tree of life. And it makes happy those who grasp hold of her, grasp hold of what? Wisdom, grasp hold of understanding. Very interesting, isn't it? And I could spend a whole night, trust me, I won't, <laughs> but comparing Israel and the fig tree. Very much through scripture, we see the analogy and the comparison. And I, for one, love things, so that's good with me. <laughs> Yochanan John chapter 15 says, Yeshua is speaking, I am the vine, and you are the branches. And if you know how the branches work on a vine, if you are departed from that vine, if you're separated, you don't bear anything. You're dead. You're done. And even what's connected to the vine, it, it, if it's producing but not doing well, it's going to get cut back so that it can produce better. The more you draw into that vine, the better that you are. So again, we see many, many analogies, many of the pictures throughout the scripture, different authors, different backgrounds. Obviously, they weren't all farmers, they weren't all living on the Moshav, but they, they caught something here, and I think especially because of seeing Yeshua say, I am the root, and seeing that he is the stem that comes forth. I want to take you back to that. I want to take you to Yeshua, to Isaiah. The spring, the, I'm sorry, the stem that springs forth from Yeshua, from Jesse, the branch that comes forth, okay? The reason I want to take you there is to talk about the Spirit of the Lord resting on him. We know this is Messiah. And if I'm going to look, I want to see him. I want to see that why he is called and how I can see and what that means to me if he has been putting himself into this analogy of a tree. So I see it on Isaiah, what I've just read to you. Then I notice our prophet Zechariah, Zechariah chapter 6, verses 12 and 13. I love these verses. Then say to him, the Lord of armies, Adonai Zavaot. Remember, he's the Lord of the hosts of the heavenly armies. He's the Lord of the host of earthly armies. The Adonai Zavaot says this. Behold. <laughs> hello. Remember, when we see behold, it's wake up, sit up, take notice, don't miss it. You know that old commercial when E.F. Hutton speaks? Well, who cares about E.F. Hutton? But when God speaks, I want to hear it. Okay, so this is critical. Behold, there's a man. His name is Samach. His name is Branch. For he will branch out from where he is, and he will build the temple of the Lord. Yes, it is he who will build the temple of the Lord, and he will bear the majesty, and he will sit and rule on his throne. So he will be a priest on his throne, and the council of Shalom, peace, will be between the two offices. Wow. I don't know if you know, but we just hit pay dirt. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Put your roots down, drink it up, and grow with this, because what we're just told by the prophet is so amazing. 
What do we always cry out for in the Pesach? Next year in Jerusalem. Next year in Jerusalem. But what did the Israelis cry out for? Next year in the rebuilt temple. Mm -hmm. Next year yeah, in yeah. God's temple on earth. Do you know what Israel is crying out for today? In the midst of her hurt and her suffering, she's crying for her Messiah to come, to sit on the throne, to bring the shalom, to rule with majesty, to fill the earth with his glory. Oh, I can hardly wait. And that's what he was saying. This root out of Jesse that's going to spring up, that's going to branch out, that's going to fill the face of the earth is Samach. He is the branch. He is Adonai Sabaot. He is priest and he is king. That's supposed to be two different ones. But he is God. And God is able to do it all, be it all, think it all, plan it all, create it all, keep it all, and fulfill it all. Mm -hmm. And he will. Every I dotted, every T crossed, in our Hebrew, every jot and every tittle will be completely fulfilled in him. And he will rule and reign from Yerushalayim. And there will be no more Hamas tunnels. There will be no more war. There will be Shalom. A thousand years on this earth, we're told. This earth hasn't known a thousand days of shalom. And it's going to have a thousand years. Oh, yes, the trees in Israel are crying out for it. Yes, because this is when we'll hear some of what we sing. But before I get there, let me give you Habakkuk. Habakkuk, chapter 2, verse 14. For the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord. Remember what we read in the Proverbs? Get wisdom. Get understanding. When you get the knowledge, you'll be happy. And this isn't ha-ha happy. This is a fulfilled, satisfying happiness. And how is it? It's with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. I think long and hard on that expression, the waters covering the sea. I am not quite sure how to get to the depth of that because the sea is water. It's deep. It's, it's, yeah, there's got to be more there. It's deeper. I'm going to go swimming one day and bring it back in another lesson, okay? Or maybe I'll be like the Ted scene, I'll float. Who knows? But when, that, when the Lord sits on his throne, when his glory, as we see described by the prophet Ishahu, who says just his train filled the whole temple with his glory, when he is there on earth, then the whole earth will see the glory of the Lord. The whole earth will be satiated. I guess that's what it's saying, that there's, there's, they're, they're, they've got all the water they need. You know, that's what a tree needs. A tree needs those early rains and those latter rains. You, you know, absolutely, if you don't have water, you're not, you, the roots come up to the surface. If you want to know why roots are near on the surface when you see a tree that way, they're looking for water. When the water is deep, the roots go down deep. That's what they're doing. They're reaching out, trying to find the water. So at this time, when the earth is filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord, Yes, Shabbat, Isaiah, back in chapter 11 again, in verses 9 and 10, he says, They will not hurt nor destroy in my holy mountain when his... The, his government is sitting on this earth because the earth will be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Hello, Habakkuk, Yeshahu, did you two talk to each other? Because you're sure saying the same thing. But we know they didn't. But yet, God gave them both that same message. And then Yeshahu, Isaiah goes on and says, and on that day, don't miss it, on that day, the nations will resort to the root of Jesse, mm -hmm. to the root of Yeshua who will stand as a signal flag for the peoples, and his resting place will be glorious. Remember, it's glorious when we have that knowledge and understanding we're filled with the Lord. It's all coming together, and it's all a beautiful picture. Proverbs 3.18, again, is where I drew that from. For wisdom, for knowledge, for understanding, you're like the tree of life that makes one that makes a glorious picture, and that's when 
Isaiah, Yeshua 55 and verse 12, the trees of the field will clap their hands. And 1 Chronicles 16.33 says, and the trees of the forest will sing for joy in the presence of Adonai, for he's coming to judge the earth. Do you know all of creation is, is moaning for that? And they say it's all in that minor key, moaning. I think we don't have a clue yet. Can you imagine? Yes, we're going to be praising him and singing his praises and bringing in worship to him, but it's not going to be just the people. It's going to be the trees of the field. It's going to be the mountains alive with their singing. It's going to be a whole earth. The rocks cry out. The mountains sing. The trees clap their hands. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> what a view. And I think, okay, Wizard of Oz, you tried a little. You had trees that were moving and some of these <laughs> other analogies we said tonight. But it, you ain't seen nothing yet to put it in my good English. <laughs> okay. Why? Because the branch sprouts forth and fills the base of the earth. I think long and hard how excited I'm going to be to be in the presence of the Lord in heaven. <coughs> the first moment in heaven. You know, will we sing and shout and dance for joy or will we fall on our face in worship and awe? And I think we're going to do both. I think jumping jacks have nothing over us. We're going to be down and up and down and up. And I even see my brother who has preceded me at home to glory. And he used to say, when I know I'm in heaven, is I'm just going to sit. And he, he, he would say, and, and I mean no offense, I hope it's not wrong to say it, but he said, I'll sit Indian style. You know, the legs cross, mm -hmm. sit on the floor of heaven and just have a puddle of my tears. And I picture my brother that way. In the midst of the glory, the joy of being home, that's going to spill over. And this earth, what it's going to see, how can the earth contain it? That's why I think everything does have to cry out. And I hear the Messiah himself say, you know, if, if it isn't said, even the rocks would cry out. I think everything's going to have a voice. I think everything's going to have a way to praise and worship its creator that we haven't even begun to see or know or understand. So if you're a tree lover, that's fine. Just love the best tree. The one whose roots grow down deep. And that's where I need to bring us to before I have to conclude because that clock doesn't stop. I want to take you to Romans 11. And it, it, nobody should have been surprised if you know Romans 11 that we'd end up here. Yeah. Because we have quite a picture here. When we read verses 11 through 16, we're reading, and let me get to it. We're reading in those verses, and I'm not going to read all of them for the sake of time. Here we go. I knew I had it in here. But we're all Paul is speaking. Chapters 9, 10, 11 of Romans is very much Israel's past, Israel's present, and Israel's future. So when we're in chapter 11, we're looking to the future, but we're also dealing with what's happened presently. And presently, Israel as a whole, as a nation, has rejected her Messiah. When he came and he did not set up his kingdom and the glory and all that we're talking about, they did not think he was Messiah. Now they should have, because the scriptures are very clear. We have many, many, many scriptures, and they'll even say, okay, those are the scriptures for Mashiach ben Yosef. They are for the, the suffering Messiah. But then we want Mashiach ben David. We want Messiah, son of David, who is going to rule and reign. Well, what they have to see is they either have two Messiahs, or they have one who comes twice. And we know very well he came as the suffering servant. He took care of the sin issue. He will return as that reigning king that they're crying out for and that they want, that they will see that I refer to what will happen for Israel in the future. But Shaul Paul is bringing out very clearly, because they wouldn't accept, because they had a hard heart, because they had a belief, then God said, okay, I'm going to provoke you to jealousy. I'm going to call me out another people. And that's you, dear Gentiles, who are not second class, second thought, or anything else. But he's going to bring to them what was given to the Jew originally, the word of God, the truth, the whole truth, everything from the root to the branch that fills 
the earth. And as the dear Gentile picks up your own Jewish scriptures, and they love them, and they love your Messiah, they love your God, it's going to make you say, wait a minute, wait a minute. And God even wants a little bit of jealousy here. He wants them to want to go, it's mine. I had it first. And God's going to say, but that's okay. They can have it too. And that's what's being presented here. God is never thrown away Israel. He is never done with Israel. He never turns his back on Israel. She wouldn't be there in the land today if God had. She wouldn't be alive in 2024. There would be the annihilation of Israel if it were not for her God. And that's why I say anyone who claims to be an atheist, you want to tell them in, in a very short, succinct way to prove to them there is a God, point to a Jew. <laughs> okay? End of fight, end of argument. I won't take them on any more than that. If you cannot believe that the Jew is there only because of the hand of God, then you've got your head and it sound like an ostrich, and Hamas is here to prove my point to this day. Mm -hmm. Yeah, from the river to the sea, all of Israel will be free. Yeah. 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 change the word in there. Yes. <laughs> I get God's word. And God put his name on that land, and he said it. So yeah. he made it very clear. Those branches that wouldn't believe were cut off. I made room to bring in, to graft in a wild child. <laughs> so any of you who've been wild in your roots, that's okay. God knows how to train you and graft you in. And something very interesting happens because it's opposite of what it should. Usually the wild takes over, but it doesn't in this case. It rejuvenates the original. That's what the Gentiles are to do. Rejuvenate, bring it up, get the waters flowing again. Let the sap be coming up. Let the branches go out and let them all know there is one God. The one true and living God of Israel. He is the God of the Jew. He is the God of the Gentile. And he's bringing them both together. Amen. He's grafting them into the tree. Yeah. I love that she's the olive tree tonight because that's the tree that's given. And all tree in scripture is very interesting and symbolic to another night, another study. But staying on track, notice they're grafted into the same root. Well, what's the root? Isaiah told us. The root is the root, the stem of Jesse. It's the branch that would spring up and fill the face of the earth. The salvation is of the Jew, the Jew called Yeshua, the Jew called Messiah, and it's for the entire world. Yes. I love Romans 1.16. My dad's mantra, my mantra, and I hear Bruce say it also, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of the Messiah, for it is the power of God, of Elohim, and to salvation for all who will believe. Yes. To the Jew first, yes, he brought it to the Jew first. That's it. It's history. It's fact. Whether you like it or not, okay, God has an order. But it's also for the Gentile. And here we see the two being grafted in. We see that, that this one, and I gave it to you in Isaiah. Let me give it to you in Yeshua, Isaiah. And not real think. Because you're going to say, wait a minute. But I'm going to give it to you in chapter 53. We know 53 well. We know it's a picture of the Passover lamb. We see that analogy and we think of that so much. We miss verse 2. Isaiah 53, verse 2, For he grew up before him like a tender shoot, and like a root out of dry ground. How does a root come out of dry ground? Miracle. Yeah. That's it. It's a miracle. Hallelujah. God's still doing miracles. He did a miracle in putting himself, God of creation, put himself into a human form. Put that into a womb of a little Jewish girl and brought out the salvation of the world. Grew up, spring out, fills the face of this earth. Whoa! 
I love the analogy. Does God love the trees? Yes. He created the trees. I mentioned earlier for enjoyment, for sustenance, for protection, for shelter. Shelter from the storms of life. They use trees in all ways to shelter. But let me take you there too. Because I think all of that is a smaller picture of the greater picture. A foreshadowing, however you want to put it. Because God doesn't want you to miss the greater protection. Mm -hmm. He doesn't want you to miss in the greatest storm, which is your life. Mm -hmm. There is a protection. Mm -hmm. There is a shield. You see, at a point in time, man took a tree. He took a tree to sentence a man to death. Scripture says, cursed is the one who hangs on a tree. Mm -hmm. That's Dabarim 21-23. And yes, Yeshua took on the curse of mm -hmm. sin. What's the curse of sin? It's death. Everything dies, folks. I don't know if you've realized that, but everything dies. Mm -hmm. Nothing lasts forever except our God and the new life that he brings because when Yeshua took on that curse he didn't get defeated Satan might have thought he had a victory that day but he went down in a crushing defeat because Messiah's heel was on his head and he crushed him and he crushed him for all time and he crushed him for every human from Adam to the last one he crushed him because he was greater than the curse of sin, which was death. And he sprang out into new and abundant life, resurrected from the dead, and he is alive forevermore. Hallelujah. That's what happened. You see, he nailed himself to a tree. And I say he nailed himself because he laid down his life willingly. Nobody took it from him. Nobody was stronger than him. Nobody was able to do this. He laid down his life. He did it willingly. He spilled his blood. Remember our Tolot? Remember that little worm that attaches to the tree and then gives its life, feeds the babies that are born between it and the tree. Stains a tree crimson red. Mm -hmm. Three days later, that mama talat falls off, and the little babies are able to go, but they're crimson red, stained mm -hmm. with her blood. Mm -hmm. And what's left on the tree miraculously turns white. Mm -hmm. I'll let you draw the yep. analogy there. Will your sins be as scarlet? Will be white as snow? Wow. So what we see in him conquering the curse of death and him raising from the dead victorious, we see that we can even say he is the tree of life because he is the one who brings us life. You know, it's the root system that's the source of sustenance for the tree. You cut off the roots, you don't have the tree. It'll die. You cut down an olive tree, but you can't get to those roots, it springs back. It comes back. The trees in the Garden of Gethsemane, those roots were there in, in Messiah's day, and they were there before Messiah took on human form. The root is sustenance. The root is what brings life. The root out of the stem of Jesse, the one who said, I am the root and the offspring of David in his human form. And at the very least, we see the tree, the cross, like a Haron's rod. You know what a Haron's rod was? It was a dead stick, folks. It was a piece of wood. <laughs> it blossomed. It budded. And it sprouted almonds overnight. Stuck on the tree can't do that good. We've got the miracle again. Out of death comes life. And we see it, and we see it miraculously. So if we come into his root, as he said, you're grafted in, you're brought in, you come into his root, if you allow him, then he is your source. He is your sustenance. You will grow as the tree grows. You will be a new sapling. You will embark 
on a new trail through the forest of trees called life. Remember those marriage trees? Remember the cedar and the pine? They grew while the children grew. And if you come into that root and into this new life, then you grow in that same way. And you need to be grounded. Get into the dirt. You get to play in the dirt when mom and dad can't holler, okay? <laughs> because the Lord will keep you clean. You get into the root, the grounding in the Word of God. That's living also. Your Bible is not dead words. This is not just history past. This is not a, a, a mystical future. No, this is the living Word of the living God. It is alive and it is powerful. And you will be rooted into our belief, which is the belief in Yeshua, Hamashiach in Jesus, the Messiah. When you are grounded in the Word of God, rooted in the belief in Him, trusting Him for your salvation, you didn't work it, you didn't earn it, you didn't do anything to get it. He did it all. And that's when you're being watered by the spring of life. And what happens then, David? You bear fruit. He gave you my closing. The fruit of the Spirit is what will grow in you. That's Galatians 5, 22 and 23, because I don't want to leave you as a sap. <laughs> you don't want to be sappy. And by the way, trees that sap is because they're lacking water. Interesting. You don't want to dry up. You don't want to be in a drought time without a green leaf. You want to produce fruit. And the fruit you're going to produce is love. Where's Chris? It's love, Chris. <laughs> it's joy. It's peace. It's patience. It's kindness. Goodness. Faithfulness. Gentleness. Self-control. Who doesn't want these fruits? You know what the Bible says about them? There's no law against them. Get as much as you want. Come on, grow fruit, produce. If you've had a little, let's have a bigger crop this year. And let's let next year's crop be even bigger because we're plugging in to the source who is growing the fruit in us, developing the fruit in us. Very interesting. Let the Jewish, let the Jewish carpenter carve you and create in you and glorify himself through you and then they will say of you to Helene Psalm 1 3 he will be like a tree planted by the streams of water which yields its fruit in season its leaf doesn't wither and whatever he does prospers Amen. hallelujah Amen. dig deep into the roots and let's grow Amen. Michelle, Amen. What, was, what was special about the Tola? What was special about the Tola? The Tola? When it turned white? It, oh, the white, it, the, the, I gave it the, our sin, so they'd be as crimson. The color of the Tola, they'll be as white as snow. But it's also medicinal. It is medicinal. It is healing, yes. There's a, a shellacinate that's a preservative for wood even. And there are healing properties in it that heal the heart. And I don't remember what else. But yes, thank you. Thank That's what Jesus you. I didn't bring it up. Yes, the healer of the heart. Yep. The, the one who, in essence, preserves us. Mm -hmm. And there's so much more. I can bring the Tolot back to you another time. I'll yeah. love yeah. that. Yeah. I love that. that there's our trees for tonight. <laughs> <laughs>